Hello and welcome to Kia Ian Eero Diaries. Uh, welcome to those who've watched the channel before and welcome to any new subscribers. So video today is going to be a bit different. So if I can provide a bit of background, I started taking an interest in um, electric vehicles long before I got the Kia e Nero, uh, probably about 10, 11 years ago. And it's partly because of the job I've always done, which is, you know, looking at new technologies. I mean, I'm retired now, but, um, you know, I was always looking at new new things and how they may develop. Um, and at the time, um, everyone was talking about uh, fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. There's a lot of development going on with fuel cells. And of course, fuel cells have been around for a long, long time. Uh, but obviously, at that time, there was also the Nissan Leaf was starting to sell in yeah, reasonable numbers and uh, the Renault Zoe and Tesla had just launched the Tesla Model S. And at that time, there was a lot of debate. Some people just couldn't see that batteries would ever really be uh, something that would sort of take off. And, you know, the idea of that you go to a filling station and you put something into your car and then you can drive 300 miles or whatever is so sort of ingrained in people that I think, you know, the idea that you could, oh, I can charge at home or, oh, I can plug in pretty much anywhere because the electrical grid is everywhere. So there was this sort of debate going on and I was fairly kind of ambivalent about it. I thought, wow, fuel cells sound great because all you get out of the tailpipe is water. You know, they are zero emission vehicles at the point of use. But as time went on and I looked at it more and more, it seemed to me that it wasn't really feasible, not because it's a bad technology, it's just the, the costs involved. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I, you know, I think for me, the argument was over six, seven years ago, really, when it comes to um, when it comes to batteries or fuel cells. But of course, for a lot of people, they just can't get their head around batteries. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's an anti-EV mob out there and uh, there's loads of videos still being posted. You know, why, EV, why battery electric vehicles are not the future or this hydrogen technology is going to kill EVs. And, you know, but actually, um, it, it, you know, the sales figures don't sort of, back that up but you know there's still a lot of people out there who really see hydrogen as the future and I thought well I've made my mind up but then again I don't really have any experience of working with hydrogen I've um, you know I only sort of know what what I've read and found from my own research but uh, one of the people who uh, watch the channel and have made some very kind comments about it. Um, he has worked uh, with hydrogen in industrial processes. Um, he knows certainly a lot more about it than I do, although I think at our age we don't claim to be experts because that's kind of dangerous, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, so anyway, I've, I've invited him to um, come on the channel and talk about hydrogen and the pros and cons of it and the difficulties and you know the possible areas where hydrogen will get used so anyway i hope you enjoy this if you do please uh, click a like and even better if you do uh, please subscribe so i'd like to welcome brian to uh kia e nero diaries um thanks very much for coming on the channel um and talking about hydrogen as a fuel for um, ground transportation. So perhaps if you could introduce yourself, Brian, and uh, explain uh, how you came to have some experience working with uh, hydrogen. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, David, for inviting me on. Yeah, I used to work with uh, industrial plant systems where we had an excess of hydrogen to be dealt with. And one of the neat ways we found for doing that, and this is going back probably 20 years ago, was to use fuel cells to turn our excess hydrogen from battery charging and so forth into a nice, non-explosive, easy to manage material, which was water. And as a side effect, we got some electrical energy out of it as well. So it was a, a useful process to be able to manage some of the excess hydrogen within the industrial plant that I was involved with. And uh, it was quite effective but then we weren't looking for high levels of efficiency we weren't looking for it to be small and light because they were really big several ton units um, but what they were was a very effective way to turn hydrogen 
excess hydrogen gas into an energy source that we could use and a byproduct or a waste product, if you like, which was actually very easy to handle because what you effectively got out of them was pure water. So that's how I came into this well, sort of 20 years ago or more. Okay, well, that's interesting because, of course, the whole question of um, excess energy is one of the things that's been talked about in terms of um, renewable energy when the wind's blowing and no one wants the power from the wind turbines, perhaps that could be used to produce hydrogen from water. And obviously in your case, you're talking about um, industrial processes, but um, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff around on YouTube and in the media about hydrogen as a possible fuel for ground transportation. Um, I mean, I guess you, you talk about fuel cells, that's, uh, the most sort of common way of thinking about it. Um, there are, of course, fuel cell cars on the road uh, at the yeah. moment. And um, I looked at this the other day, and um, there are, uh, as of the end of last year, there were 57,600 um, um, uh, fuel cell vehicles on the world's roads. And obviously the most common one we know about is the Toyota Mirai, which was launched in November 2014. And in all those eight years, they've only sold 21 and a half thousand of them. So it's not been a great success. And there are a couple more. There's the Hyundai Nexo and the Honda Clarity. But uh, between them all, they say they've only ever sold 57,000 vehicles worldwide. So, um, so far, it hasn't been a great success. But I mean... Um, uh, they also talk about uh, just burning hydrogen in a modified internal combustion engine, which there's been quite a lot of YouTube videos about that uh, recently. So, what what is you know you know what's your views on 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 the sort of uh, you know the advantages and disadvantages really of, of using hydrogen as as a product? Well, I'll start with the positive first, I suppose. That the hydrogen, of course, at point of use, what you get out of the tailpipe is water, mostly. Sounds you pretty good. <laughs> out of the tailpipe, so that's fine. Yeah. The problem, the issues as I see it, is if you're going to go for large-scale manufacture of hydrogen, and we already have large-scale manufacture of hydrogen in the world because it's used for the manufacture of nitrogen and so forth, for fertilisers and other industrial uses. But 95% of that, is generated from fossil fuels, whether it's coal, whether it's lignite, or whether it's methane, all of which have a very, very significant carbon dioxide footprint associated with it. And if you produce it from methane, it also has, it as a, as a waste product, some of the methane passes through the system and comes out, effectively comes out the exhaust pipe. So it's not without its consequences if you carry on with the current level of production. Also, hydrogen, it's not an energy source in, it, in and of itself. What it is effectively, you convert something else into hydrogen, which takes a, an amount of energy to do that, and then you ultimately convert that hydrogen into useful work or energy, in your vehicle, in your heating system, in your home, possibly, and for whatever other uses you put it to. But each of those conversion levels are not 100% successful. In fact, it's a conversion rate, effectively, energy to operational use for hydrogen is about 60%. For electricity, uh, from generation to operation, is about 77%. But most of the energy which goes into hydrogen for steam reformation is either burning stuff or it's electrical energy. And if it's electrical energy, you're generating an awful amount of electrical energy. And it takes something like between three and four times the amount of energy to generate a useful amount of hydrogen compared to the amount of energy you need to turn your battery in your car from an empty battery into a full battery. Um, it's the efficiency of a, a battery is, is a worst case, around about one and a half times. It takes one and a half times the amount of energy to fill your battery with one times the amount of energy. Whereas with hydrogen, it would take 
say best case, three times the amount of energy to turn it into one times the amount of energy in your hydrogen tank, which you then use to drive your vehicle around. So there's an awful lot of energy required and all the systems of production of hydrogen have a carbon dioxide footprint, whether that's, and I'll just quote different types, you've got everything from white hydrogen, which is naturally occurring hydrogen within the within the rocks, within the planet, and that's incredibly rare. That's actually hydrogen as a gas. Um, you've got black, which is generated from coal. You've got brown, which is generated from uh, lignite. You've got grey hydrogen, which is probably the bulk of it, which is generated from methane. Yeah, I've heard of that. All of those, all of those have a CO2 footprint. You've then got blue hydrogen, which gives the impression it's a conversion of methane but with carbon capture but as somebody who's been sort of involved in big plant and big process systems i've yet to see a successful carbon capture system it is possible at the moment to capture some but uh, by no means all of it and then you go and store it underground which mm. you know suggest to me at some point that has the potential to leak away and so forth because it's a gas rather than a liquid which is usually they're using old oil reserves or well yeah. the, the voids that you've left with old oil reserves to store it in right. you've got and then you've got green hydrogen which is produced from a water by electrolysis but it requires an incredible amount of energy to do that because hy the hydrogen oxygen bond in water is actually quite strong and it needs quite a lot of energy and certainly was it something like, is it 1% or 2% of global hydrogen projection is, is green? 95% um, of it is effectively black, brown or grey. Um, and finally, you've got pink hydrogen, which is using nuclear power. Oh. Well, green hydrogen, also, sorry, the green hydrogen bit I should have covered, is it uses renewable energy. But that is the problem with renewable energy, um, is that it's... You're talking about an energy process which has a, requires a large amount of consistently provided energy. And wind and solar is really good, but you then need somewhere to store it, which is battery storage or other systems of storing the energy you've generated from wind and solar. So there's a, an awful lot of energy goes into making it. It's not a one-for-one -one conversion rate by any means. And then... Ultimately, you either burn it in a piston engine or you convert it in a fuel cell, both of which generates waste heat, so they're not dead efficient. And we then get to the point of the other aspects of it, which is about the pressure that you need to store this stuff at and the impact, because hydrogen is a very difficult gas to manage much more difficult than the likes of methane or even carbon dioxide. I can explain that if you want. Yeah, I, I, I think um, th that whole sort of storage and managing of the product once it's been produced is, is, um, is clearly not a simple thing. I, I had no idea that there were all these colours of the rainbow of uh, hydrogen. I, I'd heard of grey hydrogen made, I think, from natural gas or methane yes. steam, steam reforming and that yeah. obviously needs some energy and, and co2 as you say is given off and i'd heard of blue hydrogen where they say okay then we'll capture the co2 and, and um you know carbon you know that that great white hope as it were if that's the right word of the fossil fuel industry is is uh carbon capture and storage which has never really gone anywhere with coal fired or power stations and, and and other you know fossil fuel power stations as far as i can see they they just don't want to put the money into it um and and the technology seems a bit sort of problematic it's not really sorted but i'd never heard of you know because sort of pink hydrogen from nuclear is a because i think you know here in france i mean 75 percent of all the electricity we generate in france is is nuclear so it's carbon free but of course the problem with nuclear um is i guess you can't turn the wick down on a nuclear power station it ha it produces a consistent output all the time so at night when we're all sleeping here in france and nobody really wants the power 
that power is having to be dumped somewhere. And I'm saying, yeah, go on, carry on, put it into my car then. You know, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for light duty vehicles, this is see, my, my view is that for light duty vehicles, we've already demonstrated that electric cars can be simple and easy to use. There is the issue with infrastructure for people who are doing a lot of traveling, but that, as you've seen in France and that we're seeing here in the UK, it's getting better and better, faster and faster. Yeah. And becoming, the availability is becoming such that you don't think about it half as much as you did two years ago when mm. you're going on lock. And the hydrogen infrastructure at the moment barely exists. We've got something like seven or eight hydrogen stations in the UK, and they're about 50-50 split between light duty vehicles, cars, light vans, and um, transport, which is buses. Mm. And the hydrogen buses thing, they they seem to come and go at the moment in the UK, that they, they have difficulty with the filling stations, and that means they get with service, as they did in Aberdeen and uh, in Liverpool. Now, I'm sure they go back into service, but there is a bit like electricity in the early days. There is an enormous amount of infrastructure, but this is infrastructure from absolutely from the bottom up that needs to be built, which is to store hydrogen, to transport hydrogen, whereas our electrical transport system just needs to be improved, whereas our hydrogen transport system needs to be absolutely built from the bottom up. It has to be created from nothing. That's a really, yeah. really good point. And, uh, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we know that hydrogen at point of use is clean. As you said, the only waste mm. product is water. But it seems to me that the amount of energy you need to get from, you know, even if it's green hydrogen, which, as you say, is less than 5% of all the hydrogen in the world today, even if that could be massively expanded, the amount of energy you're using to create it um, is no better than turning crude oil into gasoline or diesel with pumping it, shipping it, refining it, and getting it again to the filling station. I mean, it's huge amounts of energy. I, I was explaining to, to a EV naysayer on one of these channels that, look, you know, the gallon of petrol you put in your car at the filling station didn't come out the ground as petrol. You know, it had to be made, it had to be manufactured. And by the time it gets into your tank, 50% of the potential energy in the crude is already gone um, in, in the pumping, the shipping, the refining, uh, and, 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 the, and the taking in a tanker to the filling station for you to put it in your car. And then, of course, when you do burn it in your internal combustion engine, you're going to be getting 30% efficiency at best in turning... You know, so from crude oil to miles driven, it's it's probably about 25% or 20% or efficient. Whereas you say, at least, you know, you've got with the electricity grid, you've got generation, you've got some losses in the in the generation process along transmission lines, and you've got about 5% loss when you plug your car in at home, converting the AC to DC to put it in your battery. But it, it's just way more efficient, it seems to me, in, you know, getting miles driven uh, directly in, from a battery uh, um, uh, uh, than it is trying to get miles driven out of hydrogen or, or crude oil. It is, because all the inefficiencies that do exist within the battery charging system from generation to delivery into my car sat the drive, all of those are sat at the back of hydrogen production as well before you've even started producing hydrogen. Sure. Oh, something else that I should have mentioned at the start, uh, if for those of us who are still with us, is that uh, Brian also has a Kia e Nero. And <laughs> how, how long have you had yours for, Brian? Uh, about two years. Just coming up to two years. But anyway, getting back to hydrogen, there's been a lot of talk also recently. In fact, there was a video posted yesterday that uh, Toyota have this hydrogen engine uh, it's it's an internal combustion engine converted to run on hydrogen and uh, it got picked apart by a few channels uh, obviously the ev the, you know people who hate battery electric vehicles for some illogical reason see this as a great white hope where they can keep doing the combustion thing pistons mm. and valves and all that nonsense and gearbox 
Um, and they're going, yeah, yeah, this is going to kill EVs. This is this is Toyota. They know what they're doing. It's fantastic. But if you actually dig a bit deeper, it turns out that um, uh, because of the storage problem, as you've mentioned, you 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 need an awful lot of space taken up just to get 120 miles out of uh, out out of this thing. Um, and as you say, there's just not the filling. You know, the infrastructure is just not there. No. Um, so- and most people will find it eye-watering when you, it, it, a Toyota Mirai stores fuel at about 700 bar. And for those people that still work in old-fashioned PSI, that's a little over 10,000 PSI. Right. 10,102.6, it says in my notes. but it's uh, And that's an enormous amount of pressure. That one of the issues with hydrogen which is where it's not like methane and CO2, is as you compress hydrogen, it acts, you can use the phrase, it acts as a liquid, but it doesn't become a liquid. For hydrogen gas to become a liquid, you have to lower its temperature down to below minus 250 degrees centigrade. Mm. And so you're not going to do that in a vehicle. You're not going to do that. It's cryogenically, almost cryogenically freezing it. So you're not going to do that in a storage facility without a tremendous amount of energy in order to achieve that. So you've, you've got this tremendous high pressure. Also hydrogen, when it's stored in a tank, because it's a very tiny molecule of one proton, one neutron, one electron, effectively, it's a very small molecule. It has the, it has the capability of migrating into the material in which it's stored, which yep. has the unfortunate effect from an engineering point of view of making that material more brittle. Obviously, you can design around that. You can put coatings on the inside, but it absolutely relies on the integrity of those coatings, and they won't be unaffected. Um, those tanks, at that sort of enormous pressure, there will be an inspection requirement for those tanks, things like that. And they actually store, I mean, the Toyota Mirai stores five kilos approximately of hydrogen, for which it manages over 300 miles, it's with a fuel cell, it's actually quite efficient. There has to be a battery there as well in order for things like preheating, because another side effect of hydrogen is the water it produces as you turn it into energy. That water freezes at 0 degrees C, so anything below 0 degrees C, it freezes quite quickly, and that can damage your proton membrane, which is the thing that does all the heavy lifting inside the fuel cell, converting the hydrogen combining with oxygen into energy that you can use as electrical energy. So you need to make sure that that stays above freezing in order to protect that membrane. Yes. So it's quite a... It's, it, it, it's seems, quite a it, it, it seems orders of magnitude more complex than a, a battery and an electric motor and a reduction, simple reduction gearbox as, as we have in our cars. But, I mean, I, I did read somewhere a few weeks ago that somebody with one of the early Toyota Mirais has now got this problem with the fuel cell and it needs a new membrane or something. Mm. It, this was like $50,000 or something. Yeah, to, again, I'm not uh, surprised. I, I mean, you know, the, the EV naysayers, the anti-EV mob are saying, oh, your battery will be dead in five years and you'll need to spend $20,000 on it. And you go, well, you're wrong on the time and you're also wrong on the cost. But, you know, that's a whole nother subject. Um, but it seems hydrogen fuel cells, um, uh, they're just, you know, to maintain a car, you know, an, an old fuel cell car is going to be far more difficult to keep on the road than than an old electric battery electric car. Well, because that proton membrane I've spoken about, that's that it sounds like something like a waterproof fabric or something like that. What it actually is is made up of either platinum, which is a very rare noble metal, or iridium, which is an even rarer noble metal. And they're hugely expensive and they are finite and they're very, very finite. So we would not, in my view, be in a position to convert every, to effectively replace every vehicle with a hydrogen vehicle because you need, for fuel cells, you need this very rare noble metals in order for it to work, which is, I suspect, why Toyota is pushing the idea of, oh, well, we can just burn it through a piston engine. The issue there is that you're burning it in air and 
the thing with air is it's 21% nitrogen. And one yeah. of the health, the serious health issues that are created by exhaust emissions from current vehicles, fossil fuel vehicles, is not, not oxygen, sorry, nitrates of oxygen. Mm. Uh, uh, sorry, nitrates, which is oxides of nitrogen. And they, in order to manage that, the current fuel, um, petrol and diesel engines try and maintain their combustion temperatures below a certain temperature. So you'll you'll have to do that as well. Otherwise, what you've effectively done is replace one pollutant with another. With another. Uh, which, again, as you do that, it makes the engines potentially less powerful and things as you're trying to maintain the burn temperature lower than the critical temperature at which these oxides form. Hmm. So it seems there's lots of engineering problems. And, you know, as people talk about that there aren't enough minerals in the world to make all the batteries that we would need to have an entire global fleet of EVs, which, again, if you research it, that isn't true. Um, mm. It certainly could be a problem for uh, a, fu a fuel cell world. And I think, um, you know, the conclusion, is, and it's not just, you know, uh, the likes of you and I looking at this, you obviously with a lot more experience, you know, with real practical experience of of dealing with hydrogen as a as a as a as a fuel for um, industrial processes. But um, you know, most other companies now they've just given up on hydrogen. Um, but of course, it's still going to be important, possibly for things like steel making um and other industrial processes and if we can make that in a green way and i believe now that in sweden there is a steel mill that is really? running on green hydrogen and the first steel from that was delivered to volvo um uh, if not last year the year before but it's still very small scale there is another uh, green steel plant under construction i believe in germany and Japan are also working on on that, as I understand it. But <clears throat> again, as you say, the entire infrastructure has to be built. Um, uh, you know, you have to, and and, and there's got to be a lot of energy required to rip the hydrogen out of the water to to make that green hydrogen. Mm. Um, and you know, a few years ago, also they were saying, well, of course, you know, maybe batteries for cars, but not for heavy trucks, because you know, that'll have to be hydrogen, won't it? Well, of course, yeah, Nicola went out of business. They they didn't last very long with their attempt at a hydrogen heavy goods vehicle truck. And now we've got Tesla Semi, Mercedes, Volvo. Uh, um, there's so many trucking companies now R&D into battery electric trucks. Um, there are some hydrogen fuel cell trains in Europe. There's a few in Germany mm -hmm. made by the French company Alsom. I I did research that, but, um, you know, um, that's early days. And that kind of makes sense because you, you you can fill a train at one end and you fill it at the other end and on sort of like shorter journeys where it's not worth putting an overhead uh, cables um, like we do for the TGV and um, most, most of Europe for the high-speed lines now are overhead. It's just sort of local trains. Hydrogen fuel cells maybe could be a you know mate it, it, it's replaced diesel really in in those kind of you know local commuter trains absolutely there there's absolutely a place for hydrogen i'm sat here as a sort of ev evangelist and a hydrogen hater every every element of it has it has its <clears throat> has its place as we start to move forward and develop a, a lower emissions type economy that's effectively it and the yeah hydrogen definitely has its place things like steel making definitely S some heavy transport and we've still got to move ships around the ocean because so many of our products are made globally and yes pieces of our products are made globally i mean it's interesting that bmw announced they're making their last combustion engine in germany just recently even today and so They'll be making them elsewhere. They've still got to transport them there. So there's uh, there's a whole transport infrastructure that still needs to be addressed, and ship shipping is a major one. So there are all sorts of possibilities yeah. for use. And and, and I, I you know I've read that the the whole point of 
renewable energy um, is that you overbuild deliberately um, because, of course, it is an intermittent source. Um, you have, um, you know, grid scale batteries like the Tesla Mega Pack, mm. like that, to 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 provide some short term uh, supply to to bridge the gaps. But ultimately, there should be um, a surplus, and perhaps that's what's going to drive the green hydrogen and using in processes, you know, industrial processes, steel making, maybe converting ships, which, as you say, is a very dirty, you know, you know, using bunker fuel on these big uh, container ships going around the world is another big source of pollution mm -hmm. and CO2. The grid scale batteries, again, they're another thing that definitely have their place in terms of levelling out the supply and demand for uh, wind and solar generation, but so does distributed batteries in people's houses um, so that you've got a supply into the house which charges the battery but allows the people who are delivering that electricity to have a far far more consistent and far more leveled demand because at peak demand the battery takes up the extra load and at low demand you take the load into those batteries and so particularly smaller rural communities it just makes so much sense for the houses to have the likes of power walls and give energy battery systems yeah. and so on there's a number of them about and it really does has the potential to make a lot of difference but yes it's I, I think also you know the big push here in France at the moment is is around solar and but it's a you know solar car parks solar roofs on company offices and buildings you're seeing it all over the place here farmers barns you know we live in a rural area and it's there's hundreds and hundreds of the huge barns now covered in solar panels and of course what it does is it takes the pressure off the grid um you know like you know me with my few panels here means that i'm not pulling another three thousand kilowatt hours a year to power my car since going from a petrol car to a um to an electric car which i'm coming up to five years now of owning the e-nero so of course you know all this little local stuff it, it 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 does contribute to bring down the you know the demand for big generating plants and uh and and for grid level storage as well i guess anyway i think we're kind of running out of time and uh yeah. it's it's been great to hear your um wise words on hydrogen um you know uh i think we're at an age where We've learned not to claim to be experts. I think that's a probably indeed. <laughs> but you know, we, we are interested observers, and certainly you've had that real world experience of uh, working with hydrogen in in your working life, and uh, and that's been really interesting to hear about. So anyway, um, I'm going to close off now, and uh, thanks very much uh, for watching uh, Kia Inero Diaries. Until the next time. Thank you, David, for the invite. You're welcome.